What's up? Ghost Fictions is here, and we're back again. This is a story where Izuku went rogue. After a tragic event which results in death of his mother, something changed in Izuku Midoriya. He no longer was the hero lover he used to be. He now developed a great level of hate for the heroes and the villains, and an unrelentless wrath for the current situation. Join Izuku in his crusade to cleanse the world from the ones who he deems to be his pests. Will he succeed? Discover it. But before we start, please consider subscribe to the channel and give this video a like. Don't forget to check the description for more information. Now, let's get into the story. The streets of Musatafu were plunged into darkness, the inky blackness enshrouding everything like a heavy veil. Only a handful of heroes roamed the quiet streets, watching for any criminal activity. For it was in the night that the lawless took to the streets, seeking to carry out their nefarious schemes. But it was also in the night that sinister figure roamed the streets. A figure that struck fear into the hearts of even the most hardened of criminals. Tensei Yukyu knew this all too well as he sprinted through the city's winding alleys, his heart pounding with terror. The distant sounds of shotguns and screams echoed through the night air, sending chills down Tensei's spine. He knew he was being pursued by the hand of death itself. He could feel the presence behind him, watching, waiting, always just a step behind. Tensei ducked into abandoned buildings and turned down countless alleys, but the feeling of being watched never left him. He tried to blend into the crowd, but his pursuer was always looming in the shadows. Tensei's breath came in ragged gasps in one alley, as he looked around for any sign of his stalker. Suddenly, he heard heavy footsteps approaching from behind and spun around to face his attacker. The black figure stood before him, its eyes glowing like the fires of hell. Tense's heart sank as he realized he was trapped, his fate sealed. Why? Why are you chasing me? Why? Why? Tensei pleaded, his voice shaking with fear. The figure advanced, its movement slow and deliberate. You know why, it hissed, its voice cold as ice. Tensei's mind raced as he desperately searched for a way out. Please, there must be a way that we can solve this, he stammered, his eyes darting around for any sign of escape. I have money, I will give you all of it if you want. Just tell me what you want, and I will give it to you. But the figure only stared at him, its expression unreadable. My judgment has been cast. Your fate has been written, and it can't be erased, it said, sending shivers down Tensei's spine. Please have mercy. Tensei begged his voice barely above a whisper. But the figure remained unmoved. There is no mercy, it growled before lashing out with a swift kick that sent Tensei crashing. Panting and gasping for breath, Tensei gazed up at his attacker, fear wretched deep in his features. Who even are you? He cried, his voice shaking with terror. The figure drew a gleaming knife from its cloak, its eyes never leaving Tensei's face. I am the hand of God. I am the dark messiah. I am the vengeful one. The night air was cold and crisp as the dark figure moved through the deserted streets of Musatafu. His footsteps were silent, and his breathing was controlled as he approached his next target. He had just finished dealing with Tensei Yukata, leaving no evidence of his presence. The figure was like a ghost, a wraith that moved through the shadows unnoticed. Finally, he reached his destination in an abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of Musatafu. With a practiced hand, he removed his cloak, revealing a shock of green hair. It was Izuku, a young man who had once dreamed of being a hero, but now found himself on a different path. Izuku sat on a broken couch, his heart still pounding with the adrenaline of the kill. He removed the rest of his costume and took a few moments to catch his breath. What a productive night. He chimed to himself. He stood up, feeling the hunger in his belly. Hungry. Izuku wandered the streets, searching for a convenience store that was still open. When he finally found one, he went inside and grabbed a bag of chips and a can of coke. He paid for his purchase and left, the crunch of the chips under his teeth, filling the silence of the night. Izuku passed by the street where he had killed Tensei Yukata, but now it was swarming with people and police. He knew he couldn't risk being spotted, so he took a detour through another part of the city. As he walked, he found himself on a familiar street. It was the same street where he had grown up and dreamed of being a hero. But now, he was a different person. He had crossed a lean he could never return from, and that realization was heavy on his shoulders. On that same street six years before. We can see 10-year-old Izuku going with his mom on a walk. It had been six years since he had been diagnosed as quirkless, he didn't care. His mother still loved him, so that was good enough for him. They were walking in the street after watching the new All Might movie. Mom? Did you see him? Izuku exclaimed, practically bouncing with excitement. He made pom paw and smash. And then everything went boom. It was so bue. Yes. Yes, darling. It was incredible. Inko replied, a smile on her face. Let me tell you this, what do you say if I buy you one of the new figurines from the movie? Really? Izuku's eyes widened. I love you, mom. I love you too, darling. 
Izuku was more aware of his condition of quirkless and the dangers of that career. He gave up on being a hero for his mother's sake. He loved her too much to see her worried. However, he still liked heroes and thought he could apply for UA and other departments instead of heroics. Bakugo still bullied him, but just not as much. As they walked down the street, explosions could suddenly be heard around the city. Izuku looked around and saw All Might fighting with some guy in a suit. Look, mom. All Might. And he is fighting. Izuku pointed excitedly. Yes, it's cool but we should go away, Inko said, a note of caution in her voice. We don't want to get involved in All Might's fight. Okay. Inko and Izuku began to walk away. Then, All for One and All Might clashed, releasing a massive shockwave, which made Inko and Izuku fall over. Suddenly All for One threw a boulder at All Might, who dodged, but the boulder fell on Inko's legs, trapping her. Izuku. Run. Inko cried out. Mom. Mom. I won't leave you. Izuku shouted back. All Might threw a punch into All for One, which he dodged, and the wind pressure reached Inko, obliterating her into pieces. Izuku could only watch as his mother died a painful death before him, her body parts raining over him. Suddenly a police officer reached where he was. Kid. What are you doing here? The policeman asked. Izuku could only point to the pile of flesh that was now his mother. My mom. The policeman paled at the sight, then gained his composure. Come on, we have to get out of here. He said, grabbing Izuku and running away. Izuku watched slowly as the remains of his mother faded into the distance. Izuku sat slouched in a stiff metal chair, his gaze fixed on the television. The news anchor reported All Might's triumph over the mysterious villain, but Izuku didn't seem interested in the story. His face was somber, and his eyes appeared empty, as if he were somewhere else. Detective Tsukauchi entered the room, exchanging words with the secretary before approaching Izuku. Tsukauchi's expression was pained as he took in the boy's depressed state. Hey, kid, he said, his voice gentle. Izuku slowly lifted his head to look at him, his eyes devoid of emotion. We will have to send you to an orphanage as there is no one with who you can stay, Tsukauchi explained, his voice laced with sympathy. Izuku's eyes widened in shock, and he felt his heart plummet. No no I will not go there, I will not. He protested, the desperation in his voice growing louder with each word. Tsukauchi tried to calm him down, but Izuku suddenly jumped up from his seat and quickly kicked the detective's groin. Tsukauchi doubled over in pain as Izuku ran out of the police station, his heart racing with fear and uncertainty. Izuku ran aimlessly through the city's bustling streets, his breaths coming out in ragged gasps. He didn't know where to go, but knew he couldn't go to an orphanage. He couldn't be alone again, not after losing his mother. Izuku's tears had stained his cheeks, leaving them raw and red. His heart was heavy with grief and anger, clashing and swirling inside him like a storm. His tiny form was hunched over, vulnerable and alone in the cold, damp alleyway. Suddenly, a shadowy figure emerged from the darkness, looming over him. The figure's voice was gruff but not unkind. Hey kid, what are you doing here? The stranger asked, peering down at Izuku with a curious expression. Izuku sniffled and wiped his nose on his sleeve. He felt a glimmer of hope that maybe this person could understand him, that perhaps he could help. I ran away from the police, Izuku admitted, his voice barely above a whisper. The stranger raised an eyebrow. A kid like you. Why? Izuku hesitated before blurting out the truth. I kicked an officer in the balls, he said, his voice filled with shame. The stranger winced in sympathy. Ouch okay but why? He wanted to throw me into an orphanage, Izuku explained, his eyes downcast. The stranger's expression softened. What happened to your parents? Izuku's throat tightened, and fresh tears welled up in his eyes. I don't know where my dad is, and my mother who lived with me died today during All Might's battle stupid All Might. The stranger's lips twisted into a bitter smile. Hey, kid, what do you think about the heroes? I hate them. Izuku spat, his anger flaring up once again. Also, the villains. They fight with their quirks, killing and causing damage without a care in the world, well we just have to suck it. The stranger's smile widened, revealing crooked teeth. Do you want vengeance? He asked, extending his arm. Izuku stared at the stranger's hand, unsure of what to do. But deep down, he knew he wanted to make the heroes pay for what they had done to him and his mother. Yes. He cried, grasping the stranger's hand. The stranger's grip was firm and steady. Then come with me, I can help you with that, he promised. Izuku's heart leapt with excitement and fear. Could this stranger really help him get revenge? He didn't know, but he was willing to take the chance. What is your name, mister? Izuku asked, feeling a flicker of respect for this mysterious figure. I am Akaguro, but you can call me Stain, the stranger said, his voice low and dangerous. Izuku nodded, feeling a sense of purpose and belonging for the first time in his young life. 
Thanks, Stain Sensei, he said, following the man out of the alleyway and into a world of darkness and danger. Izuku trained day and night with Stain for six years, honing his martial arts and weapons mastery skills. His hands became calloused from gripping swords, guns, and knives. His body ached from the rigorous training, but he never once complained. At 16 years old, Izuku felt restless. He knew he couldn't stay with Stain forever if he wanted to follow his own path. Finally, he found the courage to speak with his mentor. I think I need to go, Sensei, Izuku said. Stain looked at him with a knowing expression. I see. And what is it that you want to do, my student? I want to do things my own way, Izuku replied. And I know you believe All Might is the only true hero, but I want to kill him. Stain laughed. Ah, so that's your plan. Well, I wish you luck on your journey, my student. Izuku left Stain and found an abandoned warehouse he turned into his base. Using leather, metal, and fabric scraps, he scoured the city for materials to make his costume. Finally, after a week of work, he was ready to begin his crusade. He ran and leapt from roof to roof under cover of darkness. His eyes scanned the city, searching for any sign of injustice. And then he saw it. A hero battling a villain. Lacerin, a hero who could summon lasers from his eyes, was facing off against a man with rock-like skin. Izuku jumped down from the rooftop, his sword in hand. Lacerin and the villain turned to face him. The vigilante. Lacerin said. Worse than that, Izuku replied, his voice cold and emotionless. Lacerin aimed his laser at Izuku, but Izuku was too quick. He deflected the laser back at the villain, piercing his shoulder. Lacerin stopped using his quirk, and Izuku charged him inhumanly. He sliced through Lacerin's eyes, blinding him, before delivering the final blow. A fatal stab to the throat. Lacerin fell to the ground, dead. Izuku then turned to the villain, who had activated his quirk repeatedly to dodge Izuku's attacks. But Izuku was relentless. He took out a shotgun and fired at the villain, over and over, until the only thing left was a pile of rock dust. He then took Lacerin's blood and drew a giant circle on the wall, a V in the center. And that night, the vengeful one was born. In the police office, Tsukauchi analyzed a photo of Tensei's corpse. According to the reports and the symbol on the wall, Tensei had been skinned alive, and a circle in V had been drawn using his blood. The sight was disturbing, to say the least. Namasa then turned to the chief. Chief, this is the tenth assassination related to that symbol this week. So whoever is doing this sure is inspired, Namasa said. We will find him and bring justice to him. So don't worry, Namasa, the chief replied. I hope so, although there is something weird about all of this, Namasa said. About a supposedly shadowy figure with devil eyes who runs wild on the night murdering people. The chief replied. Well, you see, he is not only killing people. He targets specifically both heroes and villains. That is weird. What can possibly be his motives? However, it appears he also only uses weapons, so we don't know what his quirk may be, Namasa explained. Well, you will have enough time to ask him when we catch him, the chief said. Namasa just nodded, and the chief went out of the room. Namasa then went to observe the photos of all the other people who had been murdered in ways too gruesome to describe. If we ever catch him Namasa trailed off. The night was thick with silence, broken only by the sound of the motorcycle's wheels, as it approached the outskirts of Musatafu. The darkness of the night consumed everything, and the only light came from the faint glow of the motorcycle's headlight. Its engine roared through the empty streets, signaling an impending doom no one could have foreseen. The red eyes of the driver glowed devilishly, reflecting the cold light of the moon. The motorcycle moved with speed, its destination looming ever closer. Finally, it stopped in front of a mansion, surrounded by towering metal fences that separated it from the rest of the world. A figure cloaked in shadows dismounted from the motorcycle and landed lightly on the other side of the wall. With cat-like grace, the figure made its way through the yard, ghosting past the security systems undetected. The figure forced open the door and stepped inside, moving through the house like a silent specter. It made its way up the stairs to the second floor, where the door to a room opened. Captain Celebrity, propped up on his elbows, staring at the figure with wide eyes. Who are you? He demanded, struggling to sit up. I'm a pro hero. I will arrest you. The figure advanced towards him with red eyes, unfazed by the hero's words. Captain Celebrity's fear turned to anger, and he lunged forward with a punch, only to have it caught by the figure's hand. The hero tried again, throwing another punch, but the figure moved with lightning speed, grabbing his shirt and throwing him across the room. Resisting is useless, Izuku declared, my judgment has been cast, and there is nothing you can do about it. Captain Celebrity groaned in pain, but he wouldn't give up. Finally, he pulled himself up to sit and demanded, what am I guilty of? The figure paused, considering the question momentarily before answering in a cold, remorseless voice, of using your status as a hero to take women to bed, sometimes even forcefully. 
Now, you will receive punishment for your crimes. The figure drew a gun and pointed it towards Captain Celebrity, just south of his waist. No. What are you going to? The sound of the gunshot cut him off mid-sentence, and Captain Celebrity screamed in agony as blood pooled around him. The figure watched him die, his face impassive and cold, before using some of the hero's blood to draw his signature symbol on the wall. Finally, the figure left the house, vanishing into the night. Izuku revved his motorcycle and sped towards the city, adrenaline pumping through his veins. The wind whipped through his hair, and he felt alive. When he arrived in the heart of the town, he parked the bike and ascended to the rooftops, leaping from building to building with the grace of the predator. The city's scent filled his nostrils, a mix of gasoline, sweat, and smog. He scanned the city for his next target when he felt a presence behind him. Without hesitation, he ducked and dodged a powerful kick aimed at his head. Then, he spun around and narrowly avoided a series of rapid punches. Izuku's heart raced as he engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat with his assailant, who quickly moved. In a split second, he tilted his body and delivered a swift kick to his opponent's stomach, sending him staggering backwards. Who the hell are you? The voice belonged to Rabbit Hero. Mirko, one of the top heroes in the city. Izuku said nothing, drawing his sword with deadly precision. Then, before Mirko could react, he attacked, lopping off her arm swiftly. Blood gushed from her stumps, and she collapsed, writhing in agony. Izuku raised his sword, ready to deliver the killing blow, when a racer had appeared, his eyes glowing a fiery red. A shadowy figure with devilish blood eyes. So, you're the one who's been murdering all those people. Izuku smirked, his eyes glinting with malice. He threw his sword with expert aim, but a racer head scarf caught the weapon, preventing it from striking him. Then, in a show of strength, Izuku flung a racer head away, using the scarf attached to his sword as leverage. As Izuku turned back to Mirko, he realized she had escaped. With lightning speed, he chased her down, cornering her on a rooftop. Please, we can, Mirko begged, but Izuku cut her off, shoving his gun into her mouth and pulling the trigger. The gunshot echoed through the city, followed by the sickening thud of her lifeless body hitting the ground. The metallic taste of gunpowder lingered on Izuku's tongue, and the scent of blood filled the air. Suddenly, a police helicopter appeared overhead, and Izuku knew he had to act fast. He jumped into the air and sliced through the helicopter's rotors with his sword, causing it to plummet in a fiery explosion. The sound of metal tearing through metal and the screams of the dying filled the air. But Izuku's rampage was far from over. Two more helicopters appeared, their rotors beating a deafening rhythm. They opened fire, and Izuku was forced to take evasive action. Then, just as he thought he was done for, Mount Lady, another top hero, appeared, towering over him in giant form. Surrender now. She bellowed. Or. But Izuku didn't give her a chance to finish. In a swift move, he jumped and sliced her throat with his sword. Blood spurted from the wound, painting the rooftop in a macabre display of violence. Izuku turned to face the remaining helicopters with a feral grin. He deflected the bullets with his sword, expertly redirecting them to the pilots, killing them instantly. The helicopters spun out of control, plummeting to the ground and exploding in flames. Izuku stood amidst the carnage, his clothes stained with blood and his eyes glowing with a manic intensity. Izuku ran with reckless abandon, his heart pounding as the sound of approaching helicopters grew louder. Finally, he reached the spot where he had stashed his motorcycle and sped off towards an exit he knew could provide a means of escape. But his respite was short-lived as the screech of a police car echoed behind him. Without a second thought, he pulled out his gun and aimed it backwards, the metal cold against his skin. Then, with a swift motion, he fired, the bullet striking the driver's head and sending the vehicle careening off the road. The figure continued to ride until he was met with a wall of police officers, their guns aimed and ready. He leapt from his motorcycle, his feet hitting the pavement with a resounding thud. A police officer shouted for his colleagues to open fire, and the figure charged forward, his movements fluid and precise. Dodging the hail of bullets that rained upon him, he cut through the officers like a knife through butter, their screams of agony fueling his thirst for destruction. But the officers had a machine gun, and as it began to fire, the figure stood unfazed. He quickly blocked each bullet, his senses honed and his reactions lightning quick. The figure then lunged forward, killing the operator of the machine gun and the officer in charge without hesitation. As he turned to escape, a tangle of branches suddenly snaked out from the ground, their tendrils seeking to ensnare him. The figure made quick work of them, slicing through the thick foliage with his blades. Then, he looked up to see Kamui Woods, his eyes wide with horror. With a swift motion, the figure drew an axe from his back and hurled it at Kamui, the weapon embedding itself deep in his skull. The figure then turned to face Death Arms, who charged at him with fists clenched. But the figure was ready, drawing two swords from his side and using them to strike down his enemy in a flurry of blood and steel. The figure escaped on his motorcycle as Death Arms fell to the ground. But his respite was short-lived as two police cars appeared, one on each side of him. 
With a grim determination, the figure extended his arms, his swords glinting in the sunlight. As the cars closed in, he used his brakes to stop, the sharp blade slicing through the metal-like butter. The sound of screeching metal filled the air as the cars collided, and the figure disappeared into the darkness of a nearby tunnel. Exhausted and bloodied, the figure would rest until the next time the sky's darkness enveloped the world, when he could continue his crusade with renewed vigor and a thirst for vengeance that could never be quenched. The city of Musatafu was gripped in fear as the elusive serial killer known as Vendetta continued to evade capture. His killing spree had intensified, and the darkness of the night now belonged to him. Naamasa, a seasoned detective, sat in his dimly lit office, his eyes bloodshot from lack of sleep. He shuffled through papers, searching for a lead, but there seemed to be no end to the case. Suddenly, his office door creaked open, and a tall, lanky man with spiky blonde hair strode in. It was Toshinori, the number one hero, in his civilian form. Ah, Toshi, good to see you. Naamasa greeted him, his voice hoarse. It's good to see you too, Naamasa, Toshinori replied, his deep voice echoing in the quiet room. He took a seat across from Naamasa, looking severely. Tell me, was it that bad? Naamasa's expression darkened. More than 30 police officers were killed, and we also lost three helicopters and three cars. On top of that, four heroes were killed, and one was injured. Among those heroes was Mirko. Toshinori's eyes widened in shock. Mirko? She was a strong one. This person must have a powerful quirk to beat her. You see, as far as we are concerned, he hasn't used a quirk this entire time, Namasa revealed, shaking his head. He has only used guns, swords, knives and other conventional weapons. Ashinori's eyebrows furrowed in confusion. Really? He must have some sort of super speed or strength or reflexes then. Not sure, Namasa said, rubbing his temples wearily. Eraserhead was able to erase his quirk briefly, yet he still managed to throw him with an almost superhuman strength into another building. It makes me think his abilities are natural rather than quirk-related. Tashinori leaned forward, his eyes gleaming with determination. Well, that is impressive, but don't worry, I will make sure to save some time to be able to help you in the night. Thanks, Tashi, Namasa said gratefully. By the way, how is that successor thing going? Tashinori's face lit up with pride. Great. I found this girl who ran to save one of her classmates from a sludge villain, even though she didn't have a quirk. However, I considered her worthy enough and have been training her since. That was 10 months ago, and soon I will pass down my quirk to her. Great. I assume she will attend UA, which will also be starting soon, Namasa said, a hint of excitement in his voice. Indeed. She will become a great hero. Toshinori declared, his voice booming with confidence. The two men continued their conversation, discussing the future of the hero world and what could be done to bring Vendetta to justice. But as they talked, the city outside was shrouded in darkness, the silence was broken only by the occasional sound of a gunshot or a scream. The killer was still lurking in the shadows, waiting to strike again. The city was shrouded in darkness as the clock ticked past midnight. In a desolate corner of the town, an old warehouse stood abandoned, save for the eerie sounds that emanated from within. Gunshots echoed through the walls, followed by blood-curdling screams that could be heard from afar. Inside the warehouse, a group of people huddled together, their guns raised and ready to fire at anything that moved. They were being attacked by a mysterious force that used the shadows to its advantage. Every time one of their comrades fell dead, they could only see a black blur that passed through them. The only distinguishable feature was a pair of red eyes glaring at them from the darkness, sending shivers down their spines. The group leader stood nervously, his eyes darting around the room as he tried to locate the source of the attacks. Suddenly, a dark figure materialized in the room's opposite corner, its piercing red eyes fixed on him. The leader's heart raced as he raised his hands, ready to activate his quirk. But the figure vanished before he could do anything, leaving him with a sharp pain in his neck. He crumpled to the ground, his head rolling away from his body. The figure moved towards a stack of cargo boxes and pried them open to reveal a cache of drugs. With disgust, he piled up the boxes and pulled out a lighter. He flicked it on and tossed it onto the drugs, setting them ablaze. As the flames licked the ceiling, he stepped out of the warehouse to watch his handiwork. But he wasn't alone. He sensed a hostile presence and spun around, ready to defend himself. A woman lunged at him from one side while a boy slid towards him from the other. Without missing a beat, he leapt into the air, easily dodging their attacks. As he landed, another figure approached him from behind. He grabbed the attacker's arm and tossed him aside, where he landed in a heap with the others. The three figures slowly rose to their feet, looking at the figure with fear and admiration. He spoke inhumanly, his words laced with a sense of foreboding. Vigilantes, he hissed. Nuclidister stepped forward, his bulky form towering over the others as he addressed Izuku. So you know us, and you have been killing those people throughout the city. Izuku's response was cold and calculated. 
No, not people, heroes, and villains. Brawler quickly defended his comrades, his All Might outfit practically glowing in the dim light. They are people too, you monster. Izuku's eyes flickered over Crawler's outfit, an unwelcome reminder of his past. A rage boiled up inside him, and he drew his gun, firing a shot towards Crawler, who barely managed to dodge in time. As Nucleatister lunged towards Izuku, the air was filled with the sound of fists and bones colliding. Izuku expertly dodged each punch, his movements fluid and precise. With every dodge, he would retaliate with a quick slice of his sword, sending sparks flying, as the blade clashed against Nucleatister's metal gauntlets. Nucleatister tried to counterattack, but his movements were too slow compared to Izuku's speed. Suddenly, a gunshot echoed through the warehouse, causing everyone to freeze for a split second. Izuku had pulled out his gun and shot towards Crawler, who had barely dodged the bullet. The bullet missed him by a hair's breadth, but Crawler knew he had to act fast. He leapt towards Izuku, determined to take him down. But Izuku was always one step ahead. He swiftly dodged Crawler's attack and used his sword to cut through the air, sending a sharp blade towards Pop's step. Pop's step tried to dodge, but her movements were too slow compared to Izuku's. The blade sliced through her belly, leaving a deep wound that caused her to fall to the ground, writhing in agony as blood spilt out from the gash. Her screams filled the air, adding to the chaos of the battle. Now filled with a newfound rage, Crawler charged towards Izuku again. But Izuku was ready for him. He stood his ground, waiting for Crawler's attack. As Crawler got closer, Izuku swiftly ducked and landed a powerful punch on Crawler's jaw, sending him flying backwards. The impact force caused Crawler's head to hit the concrete floor with a sickening thud. As Crawler lay there, his vision blurred, his body racked with pain, he saw Izuku approach him, gun in hand. He knew what was coming next and closed his eyes, waiting for the end. The gunshot echoed through the warehouse again, and everything went dark. Nucleatister, who had been watching the fight from a distance, was angry and disgusted at Izuku's actions. He charged towards Izuku, his gauntlets glowing with a fierce light. But Izuku was always one step ahead. He swiftly dodged Nucleatister's attack and used his sword to cut through the air, sending a sharp blade towards his opponent's chest. The blade pierced through Nucleatister's armor and went straight through his chest, causing him to gasp in pain. Blood poured out from the wound as Nucleatister fell to the ground, his body twitching with the last throes of life. Izuku stood over him, gun in hand, a cruel smile on his face. Everything is fair on the battlefield, he said before pulling the trigger and ending Nucleatister's life. As the last of the vigilantes fell to the ground, Izuku stood over their lifeless bodies, his expression blank and devoid of any emotion. The smell of gunpowder and blood hung heavy in the air as the dark alleyway was consumed by a deafening silence. As he turned around, the sound wave hit him like a freight train, sending him flying backwards. The force of the blast shook his bones and rattled his teeth, causing his vision to blur and his ears to ring. He hit the ground hard, skidding across the dirt and gravel until he stopped. Bang Orca towered over him, his massive frame casting a shadow over Izuku's broken body. The hero's eyes widened in shock as he saw Izuku rise from the ground, his body trembling angrily. Bang Orca braced himself for another attack, but he was no match for the sheer speed and ferocity of an enraged Izuku. Instead, the vigilante moved with lightning-fast reflexes, darting in and out of Gang Orca's defenses with deadly precision. Bang Orca fought back with all his might, but it was like trying to stop a hurricane with a single umbrella. The sound waves that had once been his greatest weapon were now useless against Izuku's lightning-fast movements. Izuku's swords flashed in the sunlight as he lunged forward, striking Gang Orca with deadly precision. Blood spurted from the wounds, staining the ground red, as Gang Orca fell to the ground, gasping for air. The sound of approaching sirens echoed in the distance, signaling the arrival of the police. Izuku knew he had to leave, but not before delivering one final blow. With a swift movement, he plunged both swords into Gang Orca's chest and throat, silencing the hero forever. The scene was carnage and devastation, a stark reminder of the brutal reality of vigilante justice. The ground was littered with blood and gore, the stench of death filling the air. Izuku stood alone in the carnage, his eyes cold and unfeeling, his heart consumed by a deep dark rage. He knew he could not stay here and had to leave before the police arrived. But he also knew that he would be back and continue his relentless purge of heroes and villains, until he had cleansed the city of all its evils. Another pro-hero had fallen victim to Vendetta, the moniker given to Izuku by the authorities. Three vigilantes and an entire drug cartel had also been found dead. The police and heroes were ramping up their search efforts at night to bring the killer to justice. Izuku watched the news with a smug grin, reveling in his rising popularity and the fear he was instilling in heroes and villains alike. He knew better than to take on the entire hero core alone, so he decided to lay low for a while and focus on finding new targets. Two weeks passed, and the authorities began to relax their security measures. 
Nevertheless, Izuku had already set his sights on his next victim and was preparing for the kill. He revved up his motorcycle and rode down the eerily quiet road, the sound of death ringing in his ears. He arrived at a large traditional house similar to Captain Celebrities. He snuck inside, using the cover of darkness to his advantage. He moved silently, careful not to make a sound that might wake anyone. Izuku knew the house's layout like the back of his hand and went to his target's bedroom. He opened the door slowly, revealing a tall, bulky man sleeping soundly in his bed. Izuku approached him and placed special handcuffs on his hands and legs, the clicking sound startling the man awake. What the hell? The man grumbled, still groggy from sleep. Endeavor, Izuku said calmly. The room was dimly lit, casting shadows across the bed and the man's face. The silence was punctuated only by the sound of the handcuffs and the faint hum of Izuku's motorcycle outside. Endeavor's eyes snapped open, heart racing as he frantically searched the room. The sound of heavy breathing filled his ears, and a low, inhuman voice pierced through the silence. He could feel the presence of something unnatural in the room with him. His eyes finally landed on the source of the voice. Giant, glowing red eyes. They seemed to bore into him as if seeing beyond his physical form and into his very soul. A shiver ran down Endeavor's spine as he realized who stood before him. Why you vendetta he stammered, voice shaking with fear. That is the name you gave me, the voice replied calmly. Endeavor's fear quickly turned to anger. Come to kill me, bastard and what, too cowardly to face me head on. Remove these handcuffs and let's fight to the death like real man. You are not a real man, Vendetta replied, his voice devoid of emotion. And at this point, I am not even human. My purpose is to cast judgment upon you, and I will not have anyone else involved in this. Endeavor felt a sinking feeling in his stomach as he realized the gravity of the situation. He looked into Vendetta's eyes, and a wave of regret washed over him as he finally understood the monster he had become. Judgment for what? He cried out. Look into my eyes and tell me you don't know, Vendetta replied, almost whispering. Look into them and see what you have become because of your senseless struggle for fame. Endeavor was speechless, his mind racing as he recalled all the atrocities he had committed in the name of his selfish desires. He had become the very thing he swore to destroy. You realize it, don't you? Vendetta said, breaking the silence. So now, when you die, you know why. Endeavor's panic grew as he begged for mercy, but Vendetta was unyielding. He attempted to charge Vendetta like a bull, but the handcuffs on his legs hindered his movement. Vendetta effortlessly punched him in the face, sending him crashing to the ground. PP please don't Endeavor pleaded, blood pouring from his mouth. I can't condone your lack of raw humanity, Vendetta said, voice cold as ice. Forgive me, please. Endeavor begged. There is no forgiveness, Vendetta replied his voice final. The room was filled with a heavy silence as Vendetta slowly turned and walked away, leaving Endeavor to face his final judgment alone. Izuku's words hung like a thick fog, suffocating Endeavor's last hope. He could feel his heart pounding in his chest, the thump of it reverberating through his ears. Fear and desperation filled every fiber of his being as he tried to plead with Izuku again. No, please I beg of you, don't do this. The hero cried out in desperation. But Izuku didn't waver, his face twisted into a grotesque grin as he advanced towards Endeavor. His footsteps echoed ominously against the concrete walls, each step drawing Izuku closer to his prey. You will die a poetic death, Vendetta said, flicking on the lighter. Your outsides are resistant to flames, but what about your insides? Endeavor's eyes widened in horror as he saw the lighter in Izuku's hand. He tried to move, run, and do anything to avoid his fate, but his body wouldn't respond. It's too late for begging, Endeavor. You've made your bed, and you must lie in it. Izuku's voice was cold and emotionless, as if he were reciting a simple fact. He pulled out a pocket knife and forced a handkerchief into Endeavor's mouth, muffling his screams before they could escape. He lifted Endeavor's shit, revealing his chiseled abs, now trembling with fear. The knife glinted menacingly in the dim light as Izuku made a deep incision in Endeavor's abdomen. The sound of flesh tearing was sickeningly loud, a wet squelch that made Endeavor's stomach churn. Izuku's hands reached inside the wound, pulling the edges apart like a macabre magician. Endeavor's eyes bulged with pain and shock as he watched, helpless and horrified. The flames flickered to life in the lighter, casting an eerie glow across the room. The smell of gasoline filled Endeavor's nostrils, making him gag. He tried to struggle, to break free, but Izuku's grip was ironclad. That accustomed, Izuku said as he turned on the lighter and inserted it into the wound. This is what you'll feel when you reach the fiery pits of hell. The flames engulfed Endeavor's insides. The pain was beyond anything he had ever imagined, a searing inferno that consumed him from within. He writhed and convulsed, trying to scream around the handkerchief, but no sound escaped. As the flames spread, they ignited the gasoline Izuku had dosed around the room. The heat intensified, the flames leaping higher and higher until they licked the ceiling. 
The sound of crackling flames drowned out Endeavor's dying breaths, his body consumed by the fire he had wielded so callously in his life. Izuku watched him passively as the fire raged, his work complete. Then, finally, he turned and walked away, his footsteps fading into the inferno. Izuku walked out of the room, his face expressionless as he looked at the Todoroki siblings staring at him in fear. He could feel the weight of their eyes on him, their anxiety was palpable. He continued to move, walking past them without a word. As he descended the hallway, he heard the Todorokus rush to their father's room. Izuku could hear Fayumi's gasp and the thud of her falling to the ground. Shoto's stunned silence was almost deafening. He wondered what they were thinking and feeling at this moment. But he knew he couldn't stay and find out. He had to leave to continue his mission. He walked out of the house and saw the sun rising in the sky, painting the world in shades of pink and orange. He felt a chill go down his spine as he realized the magnitude of what he had done. He had taken a life and played judge, jury, and executioner. But he also knew that there were more to come. He had made a promise to himself, a vow to rid the world of those who deserved his punishment. So he revved the engine of his motorcycle, the sound cutting through the morning stillness. As he rode away, he couldn't help but think about the Todoroki siblings. He wondered if they would ever understand why he did what he did. He asked if they would hate or thank him for taking their father's life. But he knew he couldn't stay to find out. The judgment would continue another night, and he had to keep moving. Izuku's blood boiled as he retrieved the information about a Yakuza group that had just recently entered the drug market. He dug deeper and found out that their deeds were beyond hideous. Determined to eliminate the scum, he spent the entire day preparing for the impending battle. He meticulously checked his ammunition and sharpened his swords, ensuring they were ready to deal severe damage. The darkness of the night was his personal domain, and Izuku knew it like the back of his hand. He crept towards the main base of the Shai Hasekai, his prey. The guards were all around the garden, but Izuku had the upper hand. He moved gracefully so that even the leaves under his feet didn't dare rustle. As he got closer, Izuku unsheathed his sword and, with swift movements, sliced the guards' throats one by one. They crumpled to the ground like sacks of potatoes, their blood staining the deep red soil. Just as he was about to enter, a giant man emerged from the door. Izuku melted into the shadows, but the man's alertness was too keen. How who is out there? Show yourself. Rikia shouted. Izuku didn't waste a moment. With blinding speed, he leapt up and beheaded Rikia, his sword easily cleaving through flesh and bone. Rikia's scream was cut short, and he fell to the ground, lifeless. But the most prominent threat gone, Izuku entered the house, where countless Yakuza members awaited him. They glared at him with hate and fear, but Izuku simply grinned at them. Let's play. The Yakuza charged at him, but it was like lambs to the slaughter. Izuku's movements were fluid and graceful, but also brutal and precise. Blood sprayed everywhere as he dispatched his enemies one by one. The massacre continued as Izuku progressed through the house. He no longer cared about stealth, opting for a more direct approach. He shot anyone who dared attack him in the face, their screams echoing in the halls. The smell of gunpowder and the metallic stench of blood filled the air, and Izuku reveled in the destruction he had wrought. As he went deeper into the house, he knew he was close to the heart of the Izuka's operations and he wouldn't stop until he had eradicated them all. Izuku had gathered enough intel on the Yakuza hideout and had located the hidden entrance. But, as he pushed the door open, a group of Yakuza men rushed out to confront him. Without hesitation, Izuku lifted his gun and fired, their bodies dropping to the floor like lifeless puppets. As he descended the basement, the walls around him began to warp and shift. Mimic, Izuku muttered under his breath, scanning the walls for any signs of the shape-shifting villain. Finally, he spotted a small hole in the wall, just big enough to shoot through. He took aim and fired a bullet, piercing the wall and halting its morphing. From the hole emerged a man with a bullet wound in his head. Izuku pressed on, his senses sharp and his movements calculated. Then, ahead, he spotted three figures standing in the distance. Well, if it isn't the mysterious phantom killer, said Toya, smirking. Let me at him, Tate chimed in. Your massacre ends here. Shouted you. Toya stepped forward, his quirk at the ready. You mostly fight using weapons, right? Well, that's no use against a quirk like mine. I am your due. Boya's sentence was cut short as Izuku moved at lightning fast speed, grabbing his head and twisting it until it snapped. You speak too much, Izuku said coolly. Babe charged at Izuku, his mouth agape and ready to devour him. Instead, Izuku pulled out a grenade and threw it into Tabe's mouth, watching the man swallow it whole. Seconds later, Tabe exploded into a shower of gore and viscera. Beat that, Izuku said, his voice devoid of emotion. You charged at Izuku, his fists clenched and ready to strike. Izuku deftly dodged each punch before preparing a metal shield for his knuckles. He delivered a powerful force trait to Yu's face, sending him flying backwards. Izuku landed on Yu with a brutal stomp to his stomach, causing him to scream in agony. 
Izuku wasted no time and shoved a bullet into Yu's skull, ending his misery. Blood stained the walls, and the stench of death filled the air. Izuku took a moment to catch his breath before pressing on, determined to wipe out every trace of the Yakuza scum. Izuku's heart pounded as he charged forward, determined to find overhaul and end his reign of terror. But, as he rounded a corner, he saw himself face to face with two familiar figures. Without hesitation, he charged towards the smaller of the two, his sword glinting in the dim light. With a swift motion, Izuku brought his blade down, slicing cleanly through the man's neck. The other man turned to see his companion fall lifeless to the ground. His eyes widened in shock and fury as he turned to face Izuku. Rappa's muscles tensed as he stepped towards Izuku, fists raised. Hey hey hey. He exclaimed, a wild grin. You killed him so fast. This was the battle I was hoping for. Every sense in me is telling me I may die. This is what I want more than anything. Let's go, killer. He threw a punch, but Izuku was already a step ahead. He dodged each strike with ease, his movements fluid and precise. Rappa's punches came faster and faster, but Izuku remained calm and focused, always one step ahead. Do slow, Izuku taunted as he leapt away from Rappa's attacks. Rappa's face twisted in anger. And what is it with you now? He growled. Look down, Izuku replied, his voice cold and calm. Rappa's eyes flicked downward, and he gasped in horror as he realized what had happened. His hands were gone, sliced cleanly from his wrists by Izuku's blade. Blood poured from the wounds, staining the ground beneath him. But the damage didn't end there. A deep gash had been carved across Rappa's chest, blood glistening in the dim light. He stumbled backwards, his eyes wide with shock. Ahaha. Awesome. He exclaimed, a mad grin on his face, before he fell to the ground, dead. Izuku stood over his fallen foe, breathing heavily. The battle was over, but his thirst for vengeance remained. He wiped his blade clean on Rappa's clothes before sheathing it again. Overhaul was next, and Izuku would stop at nothing to see him pay for his crimes. As Izuku continued moving forward, he was confronted by two figures emerging from the shadows. One was a man with a sword, and the other was a hooded figure with an ominous air. I'm getting tired of this, Izuku muttered, his eyes narrowing as he saw before him. You will not go any further. The man with the sword declared, his voice ringing out with a dangerous edge. I will not let you reach the boss. The hooded figure stepped forward, crackling with energy as he prepared to unleash his quirk on Izuku. Let's see if you can handle this. He snarled, his eyes glowing with a malevolent light. Izuku simply stood there as the hooded figure's quirk took effect. The world around him spun and twisted, but he remained steadfast and focused, refusing to let Vertigo overcome him. How does it feel having the world spin around you, huh? The hooded figure taunted, his grin widening as he relished in Izuku's apparent weakness. Now, before we kill you, the man with the sword spoke up, his blade glinting menacingly in the dim light. Who are you? Izuku said nothing, his eyes flickering with determination and a cold calculating intensity. Hmm, too dizzy to even talk, huh? Pathetic. The man with the sword sneered. He took aim and fired at Izuku, but the latter dodged with a fluid grace that spoke of years of training and experience. Izuku charged at the man with lightning speed and sliced off his hand with a single swift stroke. The man fell to the ground, writhing and screaming in agony as Izuku stood over him, his expression stern and unyielding. Meanwhile, the hooded figure watched on, his eyes widening in awe and admiration. How? My quirk is supposed to make you as dizzy as if you had drank ten vodka bottles. He exclaimed, his voice filled with disbelief and wonder. Those are rookie numbers, Izuku replied coolly, his gaze never leaving the hooded figure. Without warning, Izuku lunged forward and attacked the hooded figure with lightning-fast strikes. The latter tried to retaliate with his quirk, but Izuku was too quick and too skilled, dodging and weaving with a fluidity that left the hooded figure gasping for breath. Finally, with a single swift motion, Izuku sliced the hooded figure's throat open, flesh tearing and blood splattering echoing through the air. Turning back to the man with the sword, who was still writhing on the ground, Izuku leaned in close and spoke with a cold, hard edge to his voice. If you weren't dizzy, then why didn't my quirk work? He demanded. Your quirk works better with weak-minded people. So tell me, do I look weak-minded to you? With that, he took aim and fired at the man's face, the bullet tearing through flesh and bone with a sickening crunch. Izuku stood there momentarily, surveying the carnage around him with a detached, almost clinical air. He knew that he had come here to kill and end the lives of those who stood in his way, and he had done so ruthlessly. And yet, even as he felt a grim sense of satisfaction at his success, he couldn't shake the feeling that something was off, that he was becoming darker and colder with each passing moment. As Izuku continued his relentless pursuit of overhaul, he spotted him in the distance, accompanied by chronostasis, carrying what appeared to be a little child. With quiet determination, he closed in on them, recognizing his targets. 
In one swift move, he shot Chronostasis in the leg, snatched the child away, and decapitated him with his sword. Turning to overhaul, Izuku noticed his opponent was about to attack him by touching him. With lightning-fast reflexes, he sliced off Overhaul's hand with his sword. Overhaul stood back, regenerating his hand as Izuku placed the frightened child on the ground. Izuku spoke to Eerie, his voice firm yet gentle, Hide, you don't want to be in this. Eerie, though frightened by Izuku's appearance and voice, obeyed and scampered away to find a safe place to hide. It's time for your judgment, Overhaul, Izuku said, his voice cold and calculating. Drawing his sword, Izuku readied himself for the coming battle. First, Overhaul removed his gloves, placing his hand on the ground to create pillars he hurled at Izuku. Then, Izuku sliced through them with ease with a series of precise slashes. As he closed in on Overhaul, Izuku managed to cut his shoulders, causing him significant damage. Overhaul attempted to touch Izuku but quickly stepped back, anticipating his move. Instead, Overhaul touched the ground, sending a barrage of debris towards Izuku. But the determined hero charged at him, shrugging off the incoming debris. Izuku relentlessly pressed the attack, dodging and slicing through Overhaul's pillars and spikes. Overhaul attempted to defend himself, but Izuku's skill and determination proved too much for him. As Overhaul was about to touch Izuku, he completely forgot about the other sword Izuku had. In one swift move, Izuku sliced off his hands. Overhaul stood back in shock as Izuku plunged his blades into his neck, finally bringing him down. The sound of metal cutting through flesh and bone echoed through the area as the battle ended. Overhaul lay motionless on the ground, defeated. Izuku's swords dripping with blood stood over him, panting heavily from the intense fighting. Izuku's heart was racing as he approached Hiri. Her petite frame was trembling with fear and exhaustion. But, as he got closer, he saw the tears streaming down her face and a glimmer of hope in her eyes. Is it over? She asked, her voice shaking. Izuku nodded, a solemn expression on his face. Thank you, you saved me. Hiri exclaimed, her voice filled with gratitude. Don't thank me, child, Izuku replied, his voice barely above a whisper. I'm not a hero. But you saved me, Eerie insisted, her eyes pleading with him to understand. Izuku's eyes softened as he looked at her. I did what I had to do, he said, trying to explain. Eerie shook her head. I think you're a good person, just in your own way, she said with conviction. Izuku was taken aback by her words. No one had ever told him that before. He extended his hand towards her. Hum, he said gently. Eerie took his hand, her tiny fingers wrapped tightly around his. Where are we going? She asked, her voice filled with curiosity. To a place where you might have a chance to be happy, Izuku said, a small smile forming. Eerie's eyes widened in surprise. Are you taking me with you? She asked, her voice filled with hope. Izuku hesitated for a moment. No, it's too dangerous, he replied, his voice serious. But I promise you won't suffer anymore. Eerie looked up at him with trust in her eyes. Okay, she said softly. I trust you. He led her away from the battlefield towards a new beginning. Weeks had passed since Izuku dismantled the Shai Hasekai, and he had been lying low, biding his time and conserving his strength for a pivotal new mission. Shiketsu, one of Japan's most esteemed hero schools, was second only to Yue. Upon learning that the League of Villains had attacked Yue, Izuku made a mental note to investigate later. He knew that launching an assault in broad daylight would be suicidal, but only the teachers remained for a few hours under cover of night. By eliminating them, Shiketsu would be left crippled. So, with meticulous planning, he chose the Day of Reckoning. As darkness cloaked the landscape, Izuku crept towards the imposing school. He was aware of the advanced security systems, but had brutally killed a student earlier in the day and stolen his ID, allowing him to bypass the alarms. Scaling the walls, he entered the courtyard, the shadows enveloping him like a shroud. Approaching the door, he spied the hero Selkie standing guard. Gliding through the darkness, he drew near, his breath mingling with Selkie's. Then, swiftly, mercilessly, he slashed Selkie's throat, blood spraying across the ground. However, with his dying breath, Selkie managed to trigger the alarms using a button on his arm. The alarm's shrill wail pierced the night, and Izuku sighed. He moved quickly, stalking the other teachers as the lights flickered on one by one. He soon found the hero, Backdraft, who stared at him with wide-eyed confusion. Before Backdraft could react, Izuku's blade sliced through his neck, severing his head in a spray of crimson. Izuku crept through the dimly lit halls, his footsteps echoing like the beat of a funeral drum. He discovered several teachers who looked more like civilians than heroes, but his blade still carved through them with brutal precision, their pleas for mercy lost amidst the chaos. Finally, rounding a corner, he encountered the hero cow lady. So you're the intruder, huh? She challenged, defiance burning in her eyes. Cow lady activated her quirk, morphing into a massive, enraged bovine. She charged at Izuku, who narrowly evaded her assault, driving one of his swords deep into her back. 
The sound of bones crunching and cow lady's anguished cries filled the air. Infuriated, she lunged at him again, her horns pinning his arms to the wall with a sickening crunch. She intended to keep him trapped, but hadn't anticipated the small knife concealed in Izuku's boot. He drove his foot into her abdomen, the impact tearing through her flesh. She recoiled, and Izuku seized the opportunity to draw a gun and fire a bullet into Cow Lady's eye, the shot echoing through the halls. Bloodied and relentless, Izuku pressed on, his breaths ragged and labored. Finally, he entered the school's court and found himself confronted by Edshaw, Pancration, and Electoplant, their faces etched with grim determination. We will bring you to justice, Vendetta. Edshot roared, his voice thundering through the night. The atmosphere bristled with tension as Izuku faced his formidable adversaries, each hero poised to strike. The stage was set for a brutal battle pushing Izuku's abilities and resolving to their limits. Electoplant unleashed his quirk with a guttural roar, sending a torrent of energy balls crackling through the air, each like a miniature sun. Izuku's senses heightened as adrenaline surged through his veins, his body instinctively weaving through the electric storm with feline grace. Suddenly, Edshot appeared behind Izuku, his body a living weapon. The air whistled as he delivered a brutal kick, sending Izuku careening into the iron grip of the monstrous Pancration. The ground shuddered as Pancration smashed Izuku into it with the force of a meteor, dust and debris erupting around them. Gripping Izuku tightly, Pancration hurled him into a nearby wall, the concrete shattering on impact, a cacophony of destruction. Electoplant followed with an explosive barrage of energy balls, each detonating with a ferocity that shook the earth beneath their feet. Surely, he's finished now, Electoplant hissed, eyes blazing with malice. Without a doubt, Pancration growled, a twisted grin distorting his features. Capture him, Edshaw commanded, his voice as lethal as a razor's edge. As Pancration approached the seemingly broken Izuku, something in the air shifted. Izuku's eyes blazed open, his body coiled like a spring. Then, in one fluid motion, he unsheathed his swords, severing Pancration's outstretched hand with such force that blood sprayed like a gory geyser. Seizing the moment, Izuku drew his gun and fired, the bullet slamming into Pancration's skull with a sickening crunch. Electoplant, consumed with rage, unleashed a relentless hailstorm of energy blasts. The air sizzled with electricity, the scent of ozone overpowering. Izuku danced through the deadly maelstrom, his body a blur of agile motion. Edshot reappeared behind Izuku, seeking to strike a fatal blow. But Izuku, with a primal roar, countered with a savage kick of his own. Edshot evaded, only to find himself face to face with Izuku's gleaming blade. With a burst of speed that defied comprehension, Izuku slashed at Edshot, leaving a deep gash that spewed blood like a crimson waterfall. Edshot crumpled to his knees, his breath ragged and desperate. Izuku pivoted, intent on finishing Edshot, but was forced to dodge as Electoplant unleashed a massive energy blast. The ground trembled as the energy tore through the air, the sky illuminated by its destructive power. Electoplant hurled shot after shot, his fury a palpable force. Izuku, his body battered and pushed to the brink, navigated the onslaught with unearthly determination. Closing in on Electoplant, he unleashed a devastating strike, severing his foe's hands and leaving him vulnerable. Then, with a final surge of strength, Izuku drove his sword into Electoplant's heart, silencing him forever. Turning back to Edshot, a sudden searing pain tore through Izuku's shoulder. Whirling around, he saw the police, led by Naamasa, standing with weapons drawn, their faces etched with grim resolve. Vendetta, surrender now, or we will use lethal force against you. Namasa bellowed, his voice echoing through the battlefield. Izuku stood defiantly amidst the carnage, a lone warrior surrounded by the fallen, his spirit indomitable, even as the odds stacked against him. Izuku stood defiantly, surrounded by the steely gaze of the police force, every muscle in his body tensed, ready for the onslaught. His sword gleamed menacingly, held high in defense to symbolize his unyielding spirit. Very well then, Namasa declared with a hint of regret, open fire. The air filled with the acrid smell of gunpowder as the police unleashed a hailstorm of bullets. Izuku's eyes narrowed, and his senses heightened as he expertly wove through the deadly barrage. Each bullet whizzed by, close enough for him to feel the heat of their passage, yet he remained untouched. But the feral cry, Izuku sliced through the police line, his sword a whirlwind of steel and fury. Namasa barely managed to evade the lethal blade, his eyes wide with a mixture of shock and grudging respect. As Izuku sprinted through the chaos, he spotted a window, the darkness beyond offering a chance at escape. With a final burst of strength, he leapt toward freedom. But just as he was about to vanish into the night, a bullet found its mark, tearing into his leg and sending a searing wave of pain. Still, Izuku refused to falter. Gritting his teeth, he pushed through the agony and disappeared into the shadows, the darkness of the night providing a cloak for his battered form. The distant sounds of the battle faded, replaced by the heavy breaths of a warrior who had narrowly escaped the jaws of defeat. 
The aftermath of the brutal confrontation lay strewn across the battlefield, a stark reminder of the violence that had unfolded. Namasa surveyed the destruction with a heavy heart, knowing that the relentless spirit of Vendetta still roamed free, leaving a trail of devastation in his wake. Izuku's body was a tapestry of pain, each bruise and gash, a testament to his daring incursion into Shiketsu, Japan's second most prestigious hero school. The sting of bullet holes and the ache of broken bones were constant reminders of the risks he had taken. Still, he refused to let his injuries halt his relentless crusade. The impact of his actions reverberated through the hero community, shaking its very foundations. Fear and uncertainty spread like wildfire, fueled by the knowledge that a single individual had infiltrated Shiketsu, laying waste to five pro heroes and numerous police officers. This, mere days after the League of Villains' brazen attack on the USJ, left people questioning the safety of hero schools and the students within. In the wake of these events, a palpable tension hung in the air, as thick and suffocating as a shroud. The once impenetrable fortress of Shiketsu was forced to close its doors, its shattered reputation a far cry from the esteemed institution it had once been. Though the administration promised to bolster security, confidence in the school had already been shattered, and an undercurrent of unease persisted. Whispers of the Phantom Killer's exploits spread throughout UA, each student casting wary glances over their shoulders as they speculated about the possibility of being targeted next. The halls of the famed school echoed with hushed conversations, their once lively atmosphere replaced by an air of trepidation. Rumors and theories swirled through the streets, with the public gripped by a mixture of fascination and fear. The Phantom Killer had become a symbol of the vulnerability that now loomed over the hero community. Civilians questioned the efficacy of the hero system, wondering if the institutions they had once revered could genuinely protect them. Within the confines of UA, the faculty scrambled to address the concerns of students and parents alike, assuring them that every possible measure was being taken to ensure their safety. Security was tightened, patrols increased, and training intensified. Nevertheless, the lingering threat of the Phantom Killer catalyzed change, pushing the school to reevaluate its weaknesses and strengthen its defenses. Izuku, battered and bruised but far from broken, continued to plan his next move. The shadows that had once provided him cover now seemed to close in around him, suffocating him with the knowledge that the eyes of an entire nation were now trained on his every move. In the depths of the darkness, the Phantom Killer plotted, his resolve steeled by the challenges he had overcome and the chaos he had left in his wake. As the sun set on another day, the city streets were cast into an eerie gloom, reflecting the unease that now permeated the lives of heroes and civilians alike. Yet, in the heart of the storm, Izuku stood alone, a tempest of determination and ruthlessness that would not be quelled. He knew that the path he had chosen was fraught with danger and sacrifice, but his unwavering belief in his cause fueled his actions, driving him forward, even as the world around him threatened to crumble. Despite his recent battle's physical and emotional toll, Izuku refused to relent. In the solitude of his secret lair, he pored over intelligence reports and maps, searching for weaknesses and opportunities to strike again. The Phantom Killer would not be deterred until the very foundations of the Hero Society had been exposed and brought to their knees. The atmosphere within the city grew heavier with each passing day, the specter of the Phantom Killer and his deadly exploits, casting a shadow over every corner. The once bustling streets began to empty earlier each evening, and laughter seemed to have been replaced by hushed fearful murmurs. But in the face of this darkness, a spark of hope flickered. As the heroes of Yue and Shiketsu regrouped and reassessed their strategies, they vowed to rise from the ashes, stronger and more resilient than ever before. The Phantom Killer's reign of terror challenged their strength and resolve, igniting a fire within them to protect those they had sworn to defend. Izuku, the enigmatic Phantom Killer, watched from the shadows as the world reacted to his actions. His heart heavy with the knowledge of the suffering he had wrought, he steeled himself for the battles ahead. Yet, in the heart of the storm, Izuku knew that his mission was far from over, and his chosen path would lead him to the edge of darkness and beyond. In Yue's bustling cafeteria, the air was thick with the aroma of various dishes and the sounds of lively conversation. At a table near the center, a group of first-year hero students animatedly discussed the recent events at Shiketsu. Hiroshima's eyebrows furrowed as he leaned forward, his voice urgent. Oi! Did you hear what happened in Shiketsu? Siro nodded solemnly, his eyes dark. Yeah, that was quite the thing. Aminari shuddered, imagining the possibilities. What if he had attacked us instead of the League? Mineta's face turned pale, beads of sweat dripping down his forehead. Don't say that. You'll make me piss my pants. We'd all die. Akugo's eyes narrowed, and he slammed his fist on the table, sending a slight tremor through the surface. Speak for yourself, loser. If that bastard shows up here, I'll be the one to kill him. Suddenly, Mina cried out in mock terror. Kai. Look, it's the killer. Akugo and Mineta wasted no time diving under the table, their hearts pounding with fear. 
The entire class erupted in laughter, the sound echoing throughout the cafeteria. Bakugo slowly rose from his hiding spot, his face flushed with anger as he realized there was no killer. Bakugo's eyes narrowed, and he growled, I will kill you all. Hiroshima placed a hand on Bakugo's shoulder, trying to defuse the situation. Calm down, Bakugo. There's no shame in being afraid of a serial killer who's taken out a few pro heroes. Then you chimed in, adjusting his glasses. Indeed, Bakugo. That would be the most logical reaction against someone as dangerous as him. Iraka smiled reassuringly. Yeah, Bakugo, it's the most logical reaction, right, Shy. All eyes turned to a young woman now getting involved in the conversation. Shai Sabara, the ninth holder of One for All, was formerly quirkless. She had been acknowledged by All Might when she saved Bakugo, a former middle school classmate. Shai's eyes sparkled as she spoke with a kind and energetic voice. Yes Bakugo. There's no need to be ashamed. That doesn't mean you're any less strong. It just means you're being intelligent in the face of danger. Shai's warm smile softened Bakugo's scowl, and he scoffed a little. Momo added her support, nodding sagely. Shai is right. Only someone foolish would face him without fear. Shai beamed at Momo. Thanks Momo. Agakur shuddered, her invisible form quivering. That costume of his is horrifying. Saiu agreed, her frog-like eyes were wide. He looks like a demon, Kiro. Yumikij crossed his arms, his shadowy quirk twitching. Such a dark being. Hiroshima leaned in conspiratorially, his voice low. You know they say that if you look into his eyes, you can see hell itself. Mineta covered his ears, desperate to block out the frightening discussion. Stop talking about him. Shoji raised an eyebrow, his multiple arms shifting. I think they're exaggerating a little. Todoroki, who had been silently observing the conversation, spoke up. Not that much. The students all turned their attention to Todoroki, curiosity and concern in their eyes. Shai tilted her head, her expression questioning. What do you mean, Todoroki? Then his eyes widened with realization. Oh, Endeavor. The news of Endeavor's death had sent shockwaves through the class, the brutal murder occurring just days before the school year started. The memory still haunted Todoroki, who had witnessed the aftermath firsthand. Todoroki's voice trembled as he spoke, his words heavy with emotion. When I stepped out of my room and saw him I, I felt strange, an absolute sense of fear invaded me, I, I felt powerless in front of him. The entire class stared wide-eyed. Todoroki feeling powerless. Todoroki's gaze grew distant as if he were reliving the horrifying memory. His aura it was one of wrath and fury, one of vengeance and death his eyes it was like staring into the void, only to have it stare back at you, but this time, it was like seeing death itself, his bright red eyes the only comparison I can make would be to the flames of hell. I stood there, petrified, as the being. Walked away like it was nothing. The classroom fell silent, the weight of Todoroki's words hanging in the air. Todoroki's hands trembled slightly, beads of sweat forming on his brow as he recalled the chilling encounter. Shai gently placed a hand on Todoroki's shoulder, her touch warm and reassuring. I'm sorry you had to go through that, and I'm sorry we made you remember it. She then embraced Todoroki, her kindness enveloping him like a protective shield. Todoroki inhaled the subtle scent of her perfume, feeling her soft warmth against him, and found himself relaxing. Hiroshima looked down, remorseful. Sorry Todoroki. I didn't mean to trigger those memories. The Kugo's voice was gruff, but carried a hint of concern. Get yourself together, half and half. Mina and Hagakur chimed in, their voices gentle. Toto, we're sorry. Then you straightened his glasses, his expression earnest. We didn't want to make you relive your encounter with that monster. We're sorry Todoroki. The room was filled with a somber atmosphere as the students reflected on the gravity of the situation and its impact on their classmates. However, they realized that, amidst their fears, they needed to support one another and remain vigilant in the face of the dangers that lurked just beyond the walls of UA. Shai released Todoroki from her embrace and looked into his eyes, her expression filled with empathy and concern. Todoroki managed a small grateful smile. Thanks and I know you didn't mean it though this may sound weird I wouldn't call him a monster. Aminari's eyes widened in surprise. Huh what do you mean? Todoroki's gaze dropped to the floor as he continued. My father was a horrible man, and although I don't condone his killing, he did bad things. The news of Endeavor's abuse had been made public after his death, casting a dark shadow over his heroic legacy. Todoroki sighed before continuing. He also killed Captain Celebrity, a rapist who fled to Japan, and has dismantled countless criminal organizations, I believe that in his twisted way he thinks he's doing the right thing. Then you frowned his voice firm. That still doesn't give him the right to kill people. Todoroki nodded in agreement. I do agree on that. Ciro leaned forward, curiosity in his eyes. Do you think he'll be caught? Then you clenched his fist, determination in his voice. Every villain faces justice eventually. 
Shai hesitated for a moment before speaking up. I, um, I heard the top heroes will meet to discuss the killer in the afternoon. Then Yu's eyes sparkled with hope. Then that means his demise is soon. After that, he will face the hammer of justice. Momo rested her chin on her hand, her voice thoughtful. Only time will tell. The classroom hummed with a mixture of tension and anticipation. The students couldn't help but wonder what the future held for their society as heroes and villains continued their never-ending struggles. Yet, as they contemplated their roles in this world, they knew they must become the heroes that people could rely on to bring hope and justice to those in need. As the conversation continued, Shai couldn't help but feel a growing sense of unease. Todoroki's words painted a more complex picture of hero society than she had previously considered. In her mind, things had always been black and white. Heroes were the champions of justice, and villains were those who threatened it. But now, as she listened to Todoroki describe the killer's actions, she questioned her beliefs. Shai's brow furrowed, and she glanced around the room, noting the somber expressions on her classmates' faces. She knew that they, too, were grappling with the moral ambiguity of the situation. What did it mean to be a hero when even those who wore the title could commit atrocities? As the weight of these thoughts settled on her shoulders, Shai felt a pang of doubt in her chest. Her kind and energetic nature had always propelled her forward, giving her the courage to face challenges head-on. But now, the uncertainties of the world she had chosen to enter threatened to shake her resolve. The air in the UA meeting room was tense as a diverse group of pro heroes gathered around a long polished wooden table. The hum of air conditioning provided a faint backdrop to the heated conversation. Nezu, the wise and enigmatic principal of UA, presided over the discussion, his small furry form standing confidently at the head of the table. All Might's usually boisterous voice was weighed down by gravity as he declared, we have to bring this killer to justice. His muscles seemed to ripple with determination, the faint scent of sweat and adrenaline permeating the room. Brand Torino, his grizzled face lined with concern, retorted sharply, easier said than done. Best Genus nodded in agreement, his meticulously coiffed hair barely moving as he did so. Sir Night Eye's serious gaze settled on Namasa, the police detective working closely with the heroes. What do you suggest we do, Namasa? Namasa glanced around the room, taking in the anxious faces of the heroes before him. I think we should hear what Edshot has to say. As far as we know, he's the only one to fight the killer and live to tell the tale truly. Edshot, still wrapped in bandages from his previous battle, stood with some difficulty. The light from the overhead fluorescent bulbs glinted off the sweat on his forehead as he began to speak. Vendetta is an extremely skillful fighter. He mainly uses his swords, wielding them with incredible mastery, as if they were an extension of his body. In addition to his deadly bladed weapons, he possesses an incredibly diverse arsenal of firearms. His inhuman speed, strength, reflexes, and exceptional precision make him a nearly invincible opponent. I strongly advise that any confrontations with Vendetta be carried out in groups, a one-on-one -on -one match would be suicidal. Perhaps he can kill anyone here except for All Might. As Edshot finished speaking, he slowly lowered himself back into his seat. Namasa nodded thoughtfully before addressing the room. Thank you Edshot. Given this information, I suggest increasing our patrol time and operating in groups of three to maximize our effectiveness. In addition, each group will be equipped with a communicator to alert the others in case of an attack. Sir Night Eye's piercing gaze returned to Namasa as he volunteered his agency for further investigation. Namasa, I offer my agency to delve deeper into the killer's motives and give chase. We can't afford to sit idly by any longer. The heavy silence fell upon the room as Namasa considered the offer. Finally, after a few ten seconds, he responded, very well, Sir Night Eye. Just be careful. Sir Night Eye's eyes narrowed with determination as he made his promise. I will find him I swear it. Izuku moved stealthily through the night, leaping from one building to another with silent grace. The heroes had increased their patrols, their vigilant eyes scouring the shadows for any sign of him. Since the attack on Shiketsu, Izuku had eliminated three more pro heroes and dismantled a notorious gang in Musatafu. But, despite his efforts to gather intel on the League of Villains that had targeted UA, progress had been frustratingly slow. As he continued to navigate the darkness, a sudden flurry of bubbles filled the air, enveloping his face. Izuku's eyes widened in surprise as he thought, what the hell? Centipede-like tentacles whipped through the air the next moment, attempting to ensnare him. Izuku narrowly dodged the majority, even as the bubbles obstructed his vision, and one stung his eye. One tentacle, however, struck him with force, sending him crashing to the ground below. Gritting his teeth, Izuku struggled, only to spot a blonde-haired boy charging toward him. Sensing hostility, he prepared a knife, but as the youth vanished into the ground and reappeared before him, Izuku's blade and hand passed through him, as if he were a phantom. The boy's fist connected with a powerful punch, sending Izuku reeling back. As he was flung through the air, Izuku could have sworn he heard the attacker shout, power. 
Landing hard on the ground, Izuku was ensnared by the same tentacles that had struck him earlier. They coiled around him, constricting his movements and making escape seem impossible. Sir Nightai appeared before him, flanked by Mirio, Bubble Girl, and Centipeter. With a stern expression, Sir Nightai declared, looks like we've caught you, Vendetta. Izuku glared up at the imposing figure, his breathing labored from the crushing grip of the tentacles. You're going to face justice for everything you've done, Sir Nightai continued, his voice cold and unyielding. Now, what do you think of my agency's teamwork? Izuku managed a strained reply. Annoying. Unbeknownst to the heroes, Izuku had retrieved a small bomb. He threw it towards them, and it was too late by the time they realized what was happening. The explosion ripped through the night, tearing Centipeter's arms off in a gore spray. Sir Nightai's eyes widened in shock, but Izuku was already on the move. First, he drew his sword and darted through the smoke, appearing before Centipeter. Then, with a swift brutal stroke, he decapitated the hero, the sound of steel slicing through flesh echoing in the darkness. Bubble girl, call for reinforcements. Sir Nightai barked, his voice edged with desperation. But as Bubble Girl reached for her communicator, a gunshot rang out, and her lifeless body crumpled to the ground, a bullet wound in her forehead. Mirio's eyes burned with fury as he stared at Vendetta. You're going to pay. He snarled, his voice trembling with rage. The air crackled with tension as the surviving heroes and the deadly vigilante faced off, the scent of blood and smoke mingling around them. Mirio charged at Izuku, his body flickering in and out of tangibility, as he fully utilized his quirk. He was a formidable fighter, and the mastery of his quirk left Izuku struggling to defend himself. Blow after blow rained down upon Izuku, each strike jarring his bones and leaving bruises. Sweat poured down his face as he desperately sought an opening. Amid the relentless onslaught, Izuku realized that Mirio couldn't maintain his intangible state throughout his entire body, or he would simply phase through the ground. That meant there must be a point of contact his feet. In a split second, Izuku seized the opportunity. As Mirio lunged forward, Izuku drew his gun and fired at one of Mirio's feet. The bullet tore through Mirio's foot, the sudden, searing pain causing him to deactivate his quirk involuntarily. Izuku wasted no time, slicing through the air with his sword and severing Mirio's hands in a spray of crimson. He raised his weapon to deliver the final blow, but Sir Nightai intervened, launching a powerful kick that sent Izuku stumbling back, his sword clattering to the ground. Undeterred, Izuku aimed his gun at Sir Nightai, firing several bullets. The seasoned hero nimbly dodged each shot, closing the distance between them. As Izuku tried to land a punch, Sir Nightai evaded with fluid grace and countered with a kick that sent Izuku sprawling, his gun skidding across the pavement. I think that having seen so many futures has made me more capable of predicting the enemy, Sir Nightai said, his voice cold and determined. Izuku scrambled to his feet, his eyes narrowed and body tense. You may predict me, he spat, blood trickling down his chin, but can you keep up with me? The air hung heavy with tension as the battered combatants stared each other down, the gruesome aftermath of their battle as a stark reminder of the brutality they were both capable of. Izuku lunged at Sir Nightai, the two combatants locked in a fierce and evenly matched battle. Their fists and feet clashed in a blur of movement, their impacts echoing through the air. The tide of the fight shifted as Sir produced his special seals, imbuing his strikes with added force. Then, with a mighty blow, he sent Izuku crashing. As Sir attempted to stomp on Izuku's head, the young vigilante rolled away just in time, narrowly avoiding a crushing blow. Desperation surged through Izuku as he flung shurikens at Sir, who nimbly dodged the projectiles. The gap in skill and experience between them widened, and Izuku knew he needed to act fast. But the swift motion, Izuku hurled smoke bombs to the ground, shrouding the area in a thick choking haze. Blinded by the smoke, Sir was left vulnerable. Izuku, relying on his superior senses honed through years of training, closed in on Sir, his knife poised to strike. He plunged the blade into Sir Nightai's gut, but the hero retaliated with a swift kick, sending Izuku flying once more. Gritting his teeth in pain, Sir staggered out of the smoke. He refused to be trounced. Instead, Izuku charged at him, his gloves morphing into deadly claws. He slashed at Sir relentlessly, but the hero evaded each swipe with practiced ease. Then, in a decisive move, Sir grasped Izuku's arm and hurled him to the ground. As Night Eye advanced, Izuku unleashed a flurry of kicks, the tiny spikes on his boots, narrowly missing their mark. Undeterred, Izuku sprang to his feet, a hidden blade emerging from his sleeves. He swung at Sir, who ducked beneath the weapon's arc and delivered a sweeping kick that toppled Izuku. Sir followed up with an axe kick to Izuku's face, but suddenly felt a searing pain in his Achilles tendon. He glanced down to see Izuku's knife embedded in his flesh. How do you have so many weapons? Sir demanded, gritting his teeth in pain. Plot convenience, Izuku replied cryptically, his face a mask of determination. What? What? Izuku didn't hesitate. 
he struck with blinding speed, his claws raking across Ur's eyes, leaving him momentarily disoriented. Then, with ruthless precision, Izuku plunged the extended claws into Sir Night Eye's chest, wrenching them free with a hero's heart. Sir Night Eye crumpled to the ground, life fleeing his body as blood pooled beneath him. Mirio lay helplessly on the ground, anguish etched on his face as he witnessed Sir Night Eye's lifeless body. His voice cracked with desperation, each plea carrying the weight of his loss. Sir. Sir. Seer. Don't die sir. I still need to learn more from you. Seer. Izuku approached Mirio with deliberate slow steps, a sinister shadow looming over the distraught young hero. One of his katanas gleamed menacingly in his hand, mirroring the coldness in his eyes. Any last words? Izuku asked, his voice dripping with malice. Suddenly, a booming voice echoed through the chaos. I am here. All Might burst onto the scene, his fist connecting with a powerful smash that sent Izuku crashing through a nearby building. Dust and debris filled the air as the impact reverberated through the area. Frantically scanning the scene, All Might's eyes locked onto the motionless body of his former friend and colleague, Sir Night Eye. His face contorted with grief and anger as he cried, Night Eye no, 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 no. Determined to apprehend Izuku, All Might be charged to where the young vigilante had landed, only to find him gone. Izuku had vanished, leaving only rubble and dust in his wake. In a dark alley, Izuku limped away from the scene, his breathing labored as he felt the lingering pain from All Might's attack. Clutching his side, he thought, such power damn it, I am not in top shape he will obliterate me, I will not let that happen. Not until my vengeance is fulfilled All Might next time, you will die by my hands, and all for one I am coming for you. Izuku knew he needed to recuperate after his harrowing confrontation with Sir Night Eye, the broken bones that riddled his body, rendered him incapable of fighting at full strength. Over a month had passed since that brutal encounter, and his patience had been rewarded with the perfect opportunity. The news informed him of the League of Villains' assault on Hosu, and Izuku resolved not to let this chance go to waste. He painstakingly readied his weapons, straddled his powerful motorcycle, and roared off into the night, hell-bent on joining the fray in Hosu. After what felt like an eternity, he finally arrived at the besieged city, only to find it drowning in pandemonium. The acrid scent of smoke and the distant screams of the injured filled the air as the news had portrayed. Heroes fought with every ounce of their strength, but were ultimately outmatched by the nightmarish Nomis. Izuku couldn't help but sigh in frustration, were they really this powerless? As a monstrous black Nomu hurled the battered heroes like discarded toys, Izuku seized the moment to strike. In the chaos, he stalked forward, his movement swift and lethal as he mercilessly dispatched the remaining heroes. The Nomu's beady, malicious eyes locked onto Izuku, but he was too slow to react. Izuku's agility won out, his razor-sharp sword slicing through the Nomu's flesh like butter, reducing the beast to a heap of lifeless chunks. The scent of blood and smoke hung heavy in the air as Izuku stood triumphant amid the carnage, his sword glinting ominously in the dim light. The fallen heroes and dismembered Nomu bore testament to the unforgiving path he had chosen, the trail of destruction he had left in his wake only growing by the day. Izuku navigated the devastated city with unyielding determination, systematically executing every hero who crossed his path. When he confronted another Nomu, the outcome was all but guaranteed, with a swift deadly arc of his blade, he separated the creature's head from its body. Unrelenting, Izuku continued his merciless rampage, scouring the city for his following targets. His search eventually led him to a group of heroes huddled together in a defensive circle. Sensing an opportunity, Izuku silently scaled a nearby building, positioning himself on a rooftop to survey the scene below. To his surprise, he saw they had successfully captured the infamous Dane. Among the heroes, Izuku recognized three UA students. Tenya Iida, the younger brother of Ingenium, Shoto Todoroki, the son of the fearsome Endeavor, and Shai Sabara, the triumphant victor of the UA Sports Festival. Each of them, however, bore the marks of battle, their injuries evidence of a brutal fight. Izuku knew he had to act swiftly. He descended from his perch like a deadly wraith, his movements as swift and silent as the wind. He snatched Stain from the hero's grasp and expertly sliced through his bindings. Panic rippled through the heroes like a tidal wave, their breaths catching in their throats, as Izuku's menacing voice echoed around them. You're getting old, Stain. Can't believe you let yourself be captured, Izuku sneered. Stain's eyes widened in recognition as he stared at his unexpected savior. The hell. Oh, it's you I guess you could say I'm a bit rusty. The tension in the air thickened, nearly suffocating the heroes as Izuku's mere presence radiated a sinister aura of terror. It was as if an ominous shadow had descended upon the battlefield, the chilling grip of fear wrapping around their hearts like an icy vice. Chai's eyes widened in terror, the cold grip of fear squeezing her heart. Her voice trembled as she whispered, T that that is. Shoto's breath hitched, the words catching in his throat as he stammered, I it's it's him. 
then Yu's face contorted with disbelief, unable to fully comprehend the horrifying scene before them. It, it can't be. Bran Torino's gruff voice, seasoned with experience and determination, cut through the tense atmosphere. The Phantom Killer. Stay back, kids. Despite the bone-chilling dread that coursed through their veins at the sight of Japan's most notorious killer, the heroes bravely adopted defensive positions in front of the young UA students. Adrenaline rushed through their bodies as they steeled themselves, committed not to letting the ruthless villain claim their lives without a fierce fight. Stain cocked his head, a sinister grin tugging at the corners of his mouth. What brings you to Hosu, anyway? Izuku's eyes gleamed with evil intent as he replied, his voice cold and deliberate, heard the news. Thought I could kill some heroes and end the League of Villains. Stain scoffed, his disdain for the League dripping from every word. Ugh, the League. Once we're done here, I'll gladly help you find their wretched hideout. As the two infamous criminals exchanged words, the heroes maintained their guard, their bodies taut with tension and poised for battle. The young students, however, couldn't help but eavesdrop on the conversation, curiosity gnawing at them. Shai's brow furrowed in confusion, her mind racing to understand the implications. He's talking about the League. And he wants to kill them. Todoroki's voice was cold and unyielding, a reminder of the harsh reality they faced. Remember, he goes after heroes and villains alike, no one is safe from his wrath. Enya's face paled, the gravity of the situation sinking in like a stone cast into deep waters. And he knows Stain so what on earth is going on. But the sudden, terrifying ferocity, a gargantuan winged Nomu burst onto the scene, its massive paws reaching out to ensnare Shai. Its harrowing screech pierced the air, and the creature rocketed upwards, dragging Shai with it, her body flailing helplessly. In an instant, Izuku's instincts kicked into high gear. His muscles tensed, his body a tightly wound spring ready to unleash its pent-up energy. Then, with unparalleled agility, he leapt skyward, his trajectory a graceful arc through the air, as he closed in on the monstrous Nomu. His sword, gleaming like moonlight, found its mark, plunging deep into the creature's sinewy flesh. The Nomu's agonized howl reverberated through the city, a cacophony of pain and fury, as it plummeted towards the earth, Shai still clenched within its iron grip. As they crashed into the ground, the sickening crunch of bone and concrete mingling in the air, Izuku landed deftly on Shai's back. The wicked spikes on his boot sank into her tender flesh, their nasty bite drawing a blood-curdling scream from her lips. The sinister glint in Izuku's eyes heralded impending doom as he raised his sword, poised to strike the fatal blow. Meeting his gaze, Shai couldn't help but feel she was staring into death's cold, unfeeling eyes. Todoroki and Tenyu's voices melded together in a chorus of desperation, she. Gran Torino, the seasoned warrior, roared with defiance fueled by determination. No, you won't. The metallic clash of swords filled the air as the veteran hero prepared to hurl himself towards Izuku. But, to the shock and awe of all who witnessed it, Stain had intercepted Izuku's attack, their blades locked in an intense titanic struggle. Summoning a surge of strength, Stain forced Izuku away from Shai, prying her from the jaws of death. Izuku's snarl was nasty, his voice seething with hostility. What is the meaning of this? Stain's unwavering conviction shone through as he stared Izuku down. I won't let you kill a true hero. Izuku's retort was scathing, his voice dripping with disdain. There are no true heroes. Stain's rebuttal was firm, resolute in the face of Izuku's contempt. There won't be if you kill the true ones. Izuku's eyes narrowed, his rage reaching a boiling point. If you want to stand in my way, very well then. I will show you what happens to those who get in the way of my crusade. Stain's resolve hardened, determination etched into every line of his face. I will show you what this old man can do, my old student. The heroes gaped in disbelief, the realization dawning on them Vendetta had been Stain's student. Izuku and Stain, each with a sword firmly in hand, charged at one another like dueling titans, their bloodlust palpable. The sound of steel meeting steel rang out in a symphony of violence, as their blades clashed in a stunning display of skill and ferocity. Each combatant matched the other, blow for blow, neither gaining the upper hand. The heroes watched in awe and horror, unwilling to intervene as the two notorious killers waged a fierce battle. Each strike seemed to defy human ability, the two masters of their deadly craft moving with almost otherworldly grace and brutality. Blood began to stain the battlefield as the relentless struggle continued, each fighter sustaining numerous cuts and gashes. Finally, at a pivotal moment, Izuku sent Stain's sword spiraling through the air with a well-timed blow. Unfazed, Stain lunged forward, landing a powerful punch to Izuku's face before snatching his fallen sword and attempting to slice Izuku with his weapon. Izuku narrowly dodged the strike, countering with a brutal force to Stain's side, shattering the blade. Their battle escalated as they exchanged fists in a brutal, desperate flurry. Stain, seizing a brief opening, delivered a fierce kick that sent Izuku reeling. Wasting no time, Izuku drew a knife and lunged towards Stain, the blade glinting with murderous intent. 
Stain nimbly evaded the attack, retreating momentarily to retrieve his discarded sword. With a cold, calculating expression, Izuku pulled out a gun and fired at Stain. His opponent, defying all odds, managed to deflect the bullets with his sword, each ping of metal, an astonishing testament to his skill. Then, in a final desperate move, Izuku hurled a grenade at Stain's feet. Stain leapt into the air, but the ensuing shockwave still caught him, the concussive force shattering bones throughout his battered body. Stain plummeted to the ground, his indomitable spirit refusing to surrender. He staggered to his feet with a strained grunt, but the accumulation of injuries proved too much. His strength drained away, leaving him to collapse again, blood seeping from his mouth as he lay on the ground, incapacitated but not yet broken. Izuku's voice was cold and unwavering, echoing through the tense air. It's over. Stain managed a weak pain grin, his breaths ragged and labored. I guess it is. Izuku's eyes held a flicker of pity, his expression softening ever so slightly. I will spare you the pain and the prison time. Stain chuckled softly, resigned to his fate, blood staining his teeth. Thanks I guess. As Izuku approached, the atmosphere grew even more oppressive. Finally, he raised his sword, the moonlight gleaming off the steel, preparing for the final blow. The heroes watched in shock, their hearts pounding as they struggled to comprehend the scene unfolding. Could Vendetta genuinely bring himself to kill his own master? Izuku's voice was barely more than a whisper, his words tinged with sorrow and determination. Goodbye, old man. Stain's gaze met Izuku's one last time, his expression calm and accepting despite the pain in his features. Goodbye, my apprentice. With a swift, decisive motion, Izuku brought his sword down upon Stain, the deadly arc slicing through the air. As the blade connected, Stain's life was extinguished in an instant. The heroes and young students watched their expressions, disbelief and horror, as blood sprayed from the fatal wound, staining the ground crimson. The brutal, ruthless act had transpired, leaving them grappling with the shocking reality of the criminal world that had just revealed itself. The students, once filled with youthful exuberance, were now scarred by the cruel spectacle, their innocence forever tainted by the violence they had witnessed. Izuku slowly raised his head, a sinister chuckle echoing around him. His gaze shot upwards, and there, perched atop a nearby building, stood two figures he instantly recognized as the leaders of the League of Villains. One was a man with a dismembered hand eerily covering his face, and the other appeared compassed of swirling purple mist. Izuku's eyes blazed with fury as he drew his other sword, his body a coiled spring as he launched himself towards the duo with blistering speed. Shigaraki's eyes widened in shock, his hand falling from his face as he barely had time to process the imminent threat. Kurajiri reacted with practiced swiftness, his mist-like form undulating as he conjured a portal to swallow Shigaraki before vanishing himself. As Izuku landed on the now-empty rooftop, his face twisted into a snarl of frustration. He cursed under his breath, a dark promise escaping his lips. I will find you one day with that, he turned and disappeared into the shadows of the night, a specter on the hunt, preparing to carry out his ruthless crusade for yet another night. The cityscape stretched out before him, a tapestry of darkness and chaos that seemed to call out to him, a symphony of malevolence that matched the enthusiasm in his heart. That's it guys. Hopefully you enjoyed the story. With that, take care.